Also, ignore the um, lovely like saliva and snot spots on both shoulders. It's um, it's fine. I'm a nanny. I have one year old. He's teething. Whatever. Hello, and welcome to my channel. I'm Mandy Grace, the author of ten young and old novels so far. <laughs> It is time for my September writing craft book of the month thing. So for anyone who doesn't know, um, at the beginning of this year I decided I wanted to um, drastically improve myself as an author and so I have been write writing? No, I have not been writing them. I have been reading one book on writing craft every single month. Some of them are about outlining, some of them are about the writing process itself, some of them are about marketing or editing or all sorts of things. The one I'm going to be reading this month um, actually just came in the mail because originally at, in January I bought 11 books instead of 12 because math is hard. But anyway, I just got another one because the group of gals that I have joined um, that we write together and encourage each other and all that stuff, um, we're called the Quill and Cup and you should check them out. I'll my camera died, but I'm back. Anyway, um, the Quill and Cup is great. I think that's where it died. Anyway, the point is, um, the ladies there are the ones who suggested the specific book, so that's how I came to get this one for September. And it's Wired for Story, the writer's guide to using brain science to hook readers from the very first sit sentence by Lisa Cron. Um, I actually did Story Genius at some point early this year. I don't, I, I did not actually realize that this was the same author until just the second because I wasn't actually looking at the book. I'm curious how different this might be because this one is how to use brain science to go beyond outlining and write a riveting novel and this one is the writer's guide to using brain science to hook readers from the very first sentence and I don't know that they're going to be different. We'll see. I still use the brainstorming prompts from Story Genius, so there's that. Uh, but anyway, the people over at Quill and Cup are very excited about this one, so we're reading it, and we'll see what happens, I guess. This one's a little, it's a little beat up, because um, the male <laughs> people did not take care of it when they sent it to me, and it came to me a little battered and bruised, but let's get into it. I am working my way through chapter one, so not very far yet. Um, if, <laughs> if this woman says, this sounds counterintuitive one more time, I might throw the book across the room. But other than that, it's been basically the same as Story Genius. She's discussing how our brains are hardwired for story and what that means and what that looks like. Um, yeah, I, nothing she said so far has been different than Story Genius. Here's what I'm thinking is going to happen. I think Wired for Story is just all the brain stuff, and Story Genius had the brain stuff and then how to actually plot using the brain stuff. That's what I think it is. So I think I read them in the wrong order. Um, or maybe, you know, you don't need to read both at all. I don't know. But so far it's all been the same. Uh, less rude. Because I remember feeling very defensive reading Story Genius. I remember the first half of Story Genius, there was a lot of like, you're doing it wrong. Sorry, sucks for you. And it was really making me upset to read it. And there hasn't been that in this. She hasn't been patronizing and condescending the way I felt she was in Story Genius, which is interesting because this one was her first, well, maybe not her first one, but this one came before story genius. That much I know. Because Wired for Story is on the cover, which I didn't realize <laughs> until I <laughs> picked this one up to start this video. It's, you know, it's, you, you saw it happen. But anyway, um, yeah, I didn't realize that it was the same author. But while I was sitting there 
staring at both of them side by side after I figured out that it was the same author. Wired for Story is on the Story Genius cover, being like the author of Wired for Story. So I think this one came first, which I don't know why I think that has any sort of bearing on why she was condescending and patronizing in the other one. But, you know, if this got a big, big hollabaloo about it and everyone was like, whoa, that's crazy, she might have gotten a big head. And then she came back to write Story Genius and was like, I know all the things. That may not be an accurate representation of her feelings at all. I apologize to the author if that's not what she was thinking. But yes, I do remember being very, very defensive about Story Genius, and this one's not making me feel that way. So that's what I got so far. Also, it's all about the brain stuff, and it's so like, like every other book that I have read this year that is like, you would not believe it story's not actually about plot yeah yeah i i knew that did you not did you not know that i'm trying so hard you guys i'm trying so hard with this book to be humble and to be open-minded and to be ready to learn from it you know and not just be like i know everything i don't need another book whatever like i'm trying so hard I'm only a chapter in. I might still learn things. Who knows? Except that I already learned all of the brain stuff from her other book slash already knew it. So, um, yeah. Okay, like this, for example. Um, as counterintuitive as it may sound, a story is not about the plot or even what happens in it. Stories are about how we, rather than the world around us, change. They grab us only when they allow us to experience how it would feel to navigate the plot. The story, as we'll see throughout, is an internal journey, not an external one. Which is all well and good. Um, I don't disagree with that at all. It's just that it's not new information for me. I think that's the biggest thing, is that I just already know it. So it's not that the book is bad or that the other eight books that I read this year were bad in any fashion. It's just that I already know it. And I feel kind of bad. So this book specifically I picked up because the Quill and Cup ladies were like, gotta read this one, it will blow your mind. <laughs> it's not though. Ugh, it's not blowing my mind. And I, as much as I am trying to be open-minded and learn from it, I do not expect it to blow my mind. I just don't. I... Here's how I feel. If this was the first book on writing craft that I had ever read, maybe it would have been crazy, right? I would have been like, whoa, <laughs> I had no idea. <laughs> this is, <laughs> this is insane. Um, but it's not. So it doesn't, I'm not getting that feeling. And I did, it was a, it was a while back and I don't like remember exactly how it felt, but I do think I had that experience with Save the Cat, which was the first book on writing craft that I ever read. Uh, Save the Cat completely blew my mind, and I was like, who knew? And then, you know, from there I learned to craft stories with the Save the Cat method, and then from there I read eight more, going on nine more, um, writing craft books. And some of them have been interesting, some of them have not been, but none of them have been mind-blowing none of them. And I think they might have been at the beginning of my writing journey. And I don't know how much of it is they're presenting basically the same information as Save the Cat and Save the Cat already blew my mind. Um, or if it's because I've been writing for what, like almost 15 years like actually writing I told stories before that when I was a kid um, I would <laughs> I would color stories like with crayons and a piece of paper my favorite was the guy who was mowing his lawn well I had two favorites one was the guy who was mowing his lawn and I would draw the little house and I would draw the green grass and I would put the little guy with a mower right it was probably an ugly mower let's be real I'm not an artist but anyway with the little mower and then I would make the grass taller and I would get a new page and I'd like draw the exact same house with the exact same 
you know, man, and I'd make the grass like that much taller, and then I'd get another piece of paper with the exact same house, and the little man with his mower, and I'd have like the tall grass over here, and like the cut grass on this, anyway, I was, you know, I told stories forever, um, not very sophisticated stories by any means, but I told stories forever, but I started writing, like seriously writing, um, between the ages of 12 and 14, and back then, if I had been reading these books, they would have changed my life. But I didn't read these books back then. I read them, you know, 10, 15 years into my writer journey. And as much as I don't know everything yet, and I am still learning, I'm not learning from these books very much. And that's not entirely true, because some of the books really have had things that I've been like, wow. So the last book I did, um, Creating Character Arcs by K.M. Wyland, there was a section on flat arcs that was fascinating. It really changed my perspective on how to write flat arcs and the point to flat arcs, and it was really interesting stuff. And when I read Take Off Your Pants by whoever that's by, who are you by? Take Off Your Pants. Hawker. Libby Hawker. Um, I really enjoyed reading Take Off Your Pants and then working through the... Sorry, it's hard to talk while I'm putting these books back where they belong. I really enjoyed reading Take Off Your Pants and working through her way of outlining. Like, I really enjoyed that experience. It was one of the best experiences of all of these book a month things. Um, because most of my experiences, I read it and I'm like, okay, thank you for presenting the same information I already knew in a slightly different manner than the last book I read. Good on you. Uh, but that one, the Take Off Your Pants, was a completely different experience. It was like... A whole thing and maybe that was just because it was about outlining specifically it was like here's a different way to outline and it wasn't about story and what makes a story and what story means it was just a method of outlining you know so maybe that's why it was different because there's all sorts of different you know methods of doing things and I don't know them all and I haven't used them all so that was fascinating and interesting but the idea of like what a story is is not something that I'm unfamiliar with. <sighs> I have one of these rants in almost every single one of these videos and I feel bad about it because I feel like I'm coming off snooty and know-it-all and like I don't need help which is not true because my writing does suffer in some areas and I am still learning and growing as an author and I wanted to do this this year and read a book every month to grow. I mean, the point was, I knew I was lacking in some areas, so I got 12 books to read so I could get better. Um, so yeah, I'm not trying to come off as a know-it-all or anything like that. I just don't feel like I'm learning from most of these books because most of them are just trying to tell you that story means more than what happens in the plot. And I'm already well aware that story means more than what happens in the plot. So, yep, but who knows? I'm still in chapter one, you guys. <laughs> so, uh, every few pages I'm going to get back on and talk. No, that would make for a very long video. Um, hopefully the next time I pull out the camera, I will be deep into this book and will have learned something that will change the way that I write stories. Myth. Beautiful writing trumps all. Reality. Storytelling trumps beautiful writing every time. Which is all well and good, but does anyone actually believe beautiful writing trumps all anymore? Because, you know, every single book I've been reading has been like, mmm, beautiful writing doesn't matter unless you have an actual story underneath it. And also good stories with, like, really badly written words that portray said stories sell lots of books because it's the story that matters. <sighs> Once again, I'm faced with a truth that I absolutely agree with and believe in, but it's not, you know, new information. Because this one is actually very well written, um, and it's nothing like Story Genius. Uh, even though she's presenting the exact same information, and it's the exact same author, it is not the same at all. It's, it's a much smoother read, it's much nicer to read, like she's not 
she's not beating my head with the fact that she knows more than I do. Like, it's, it's a much nicer read, and I like it a lot, to be honest. I do like this book, but I'm not gaining from it yet. And I feel the need to explain that and explain why, because it was so highly re recommended to me. And I want, I want to be as in awe of it as all the ladies who were like, this is the best thing that will ever happen to you. I'm not feeling that yet. Not because it's not a good book, and not because it's not information that I, you know, don't agree with. It's great. It's just not striking me, because I already know the facts. The checklist is nice, and I think I will um, go over all of the checklists when I get to the editing stage. We have come to our next myth. Myth. The plot is what the story is about. Reality. The story is about how the plot affects the protagonist. And once again... <laughs> yes. <laughs> That is correct. <laughs> what do you want me to say about it? <laughs> uh, guys, at some point in this book, it's going to blow me away. I'm just gonna sit here and wait for it. I will say, though, despite my complaining that it's not blowing me away, this is a good book. And, I mean, I'm only 31 pages in, but I would recommend it for writers. It's a good book. It's probably mind-blowing for people who know less about story. Huh, so I went camping, which is where I got sick, but that's not the point. I went camping and I took Wired for Story on the camping trip and I read like a hundred pages or so while I was on the camping trip and it was good stuff. Um, I filmed some. I filmed some like silent clips of me reading. Uh, I filmed a, filmed a spider adventure, which you will get to watch shortly. Huh hate spiders. Um, yes. <laughs> that was horrifying. Anyway, uh, but I didn't really talk about what I was reading because I don't like filming around people. I don't even film in my house unless I'm 90% sure there's no one in the house. Uh, so yes, camp camping, there were the people I was camping with, my family, uh, and then there were all of the other camping people there. Lots of campers. Campers everywhere. So I really was not in the mood to talk to the camera at all. So other than the spider adventure, I'm not sure that I did say anything at all to the camera. But what I did do was I filmed a couple of like seconds <laughs> every time I came across something that I was like, oh, I should talk about this. Um, so I went through, <clears throat> yes, I went through my camera and wrote down all the little things that I did not talk about on the camping trip, but I wanted to address. And we're going to go down my little list now and see if I actually remember all the points that I wanted to make while I was on the camping trip. And then we will read the last, like, however much of the book there is. And I'll talk about that. While I've come camping for the weekend, the geese are wandering the campsite. It rained an excessive amount last night. Uh, and now I'm going to read my book. I just saw a spider, which is hanging out on my suitcase, which is not acceptable. I'ma die. There were two on my pillowcase last night, too. I'm just, huh, I hate bugs. Anyway, we're gonna read Wired for Story after we possibly kill a spider, or just run from it and screaming. He's eyeing me. He's giving me the stink eye. Wired for Story is actually in the suitcase underneath the spider, so I don't know what I'm going to do here. I could use Wise Man's Fear to smack him. That seems like a terrible thing to do to a book. Listen, I like nature, I just don't like bugs. I, s I squished him, but he, sent he went into the suitcase, onto my shirt, and he's twitching. Ahem. Myth. 
write what you know. Reality, write what you know emotionally. Um, I kind of liked this myth, actually, because, um, I mean, I, I knew it. It wasn't groundbreaking for me. I feel redundant every time I say this, but anyway. But this one felt much less Captain Obvious to me. Uh, this one felt much more like something that people do need <coughs> <coughs> to learn. And a lot of people get wrong because the write what you know mantra is just so prevalent and not everyone necessarily knows what that means. I didn't when I first started out. So this is definitely something that I had to learn at some point in my writing career. Um, and I think this was a great refresher, even though I did know. What's happened, for anyone curious about my medical issues, um, <coughs> is that this started out <coughs> in my nose, and I could not breathe from the nose, and it was all coming out the nose. But somewhere in the middle of last night, <coughs> it stopped coming out the nose and started going down the throat, and now all I can do is cough. I can breathe through my nose now, so that's a plus, but I can't talk. <sighs> and I'm constantly coughing. Okay. <coughs> I would film this at a different time, but I don't really have a different time, so here we are. The next myth that I came across. Ahem. <coughs> myth. Adding external problems inherently adds drama to a story. Reality. Adding external problems adds drama only if there is something the protagonist must confront to overcome her issue. Or his. Um, yeah. I loved this specific myth because this is one of my biggest pet peeves when watching TV shows when they're just like, let me throw something completely random that has nothing to do with anything at these characters and it will have no impact on the story whatsoever because it won't move them along towards learning whatever they're supposed to be learning or confronting their demons. No, it will have nothing to do with that at all. It's just drama for the sake of drama. So yes, I, um... I loved this specific myth. Thank you, Lisa Kron, for pointing that out for all the people who feel like just throwing in drama for the sake of drama. Don't do it! Also, have I mentioned I love the checkpoints at the end of each chapter? I haven't gone over them yet, but I fully intend to use them when I go back through and start my revisions for the fantasy series that I am writing. Um, yeah, once I've written the first drafts of the whole shebang, I'm gonna use the checkpoints to see, you know, if I'm missing anything. The next myth, uh, you can get to know your characters only by writing complete bios, realities, plural? No, it's just reality. Um, character bios should concentrate solely on information relevant to your story. So, I absolutely agree with this, and with my current work I think I have done this, but these, um, these Robin Hood books up here, my first Robin Hood series, particularly the ones in the middle, Always in Shadow, Dusty, and the Tragedy of the Traitor, um, they are like day-to-day -day memoirs of literally everything that ever happened in this person's life, and 90% of it has nothing to do with the story, and it's awful to read, and I hate it. Um, yeah, so this is something I definitely struggled with as a young writer. So I think it's good that she pointed it out here. I've already learned this lesson. So once again, it wasn't like earth shattering, but it was, <laughs> it was like, oh yeah, I used to do that. That's embarrassing. Let's see. Oop, I'm going to drop my list. Okay. Standing here on one leg. I don't think you can see this, but I'm standing on one leg and I have the notebook resting on my thigh. The one that's in the air. Because I am a ninja. Whoop, not a ninja. Losing it. We're gonna die. Whoa. Myth. Sensory details bring a story to life. Reality. Unless they convey necessary information, sensory details clog a story's arteries. This one I found actually really fascinating to read, and I actually want to read over this section again with, like, I don't know, a keen or eye or something. See what else I can learn from it. Um, because one of my biggest problems, or, like, flaws as a writer, I guess. One of my weaknesses is that I don't describe anything. I don't describe where people are or what people look like, what the setting looks like, or if it's hot or cold or whatever. I describe nothing. Um, yeah, so when I go back through in revisions, I'm always adding the sensory details to be like, this is what's happening. Um, yes, but I've never really thought about it in, a, in terms of like, 
the story. I just think about it in terms of like the setting. This is what it looks like for whatever reason. Uh, but this was a really fascinating section um, about talking about things. Um, let me find what I was thinking about. Can't find it. She quoted the person, I don't remember if it was a girl or guy now, but she quoted the person who was like, don't tell me the moon is shining, show me the glint on broken glass. And she was like, okay, but I'm going to take it one step further and say, don't even mention the glint on the glass unless it means something. But I can't find it. Anyway, it was a fascinating section and I went to read it again. Myth. Withholding information for the big reveal is what keeps readers hooked. Reality. Withholding information very often robs the story of what really hooks the readers. She wasn't knocking, um, you know, twists in stories. She was telling you how to write twists in stories the right way to keep readers hooked and also shock them. Um, and it was really good. It was a really good section and I really enjoyed this one. And also I do think this one was actually helpful for me personally because um, my fantasy story has a couple of like, whoa, moments and I do want to pull them off well. So this was a good section and I learned a lot from it. Myth. Experimental literature can break all the rules of storytelling with impunity. In fact, it's high art and thus far superior to regular old novels. Reality. Novels that are hard to read aren't read. This was fascinating and interesting. Um, <clears throat> she did talk about uh, a specific um, experimental novel that's really good and then explained why it's really good because in spite of it, its experimentalness, it still follows the essentials of story and like the emotion behind it that actually makes people keep reading. So it was fascinating and interesting. I have no desire to write experimental fiction ever, so it wasn't really applicable to me, but it was it was a good section. Myth. Show, don't tell. Is literal. Don't tell me John is sad. Show him crying. Reality. Show, don't tell. Is figurative. Don't tell me John is sad. Show me why he is sad. This was a very interesting section because um, I've gotten the show don't tell is literal talk from other writers, from books that I've been reading this year, from like literally everything ever since I started writing when I was a small child. Um, yeah, and a lot, I remember very distinctly the first time I read something, and it wasn't in a craft book, I think it was in my like writer curriculum that I was doing in middle school when I wrote, you know, my little, it was a banana book which is not published, but anyway. I remember vividly that it was talking about um, the show don't tell being a literary thing, and it used an example from Oliver Twist um, and talked about this. Don't tell me someone's sad, show me. And then it quoted a scene from Oliver Twist where Oliver is like, he's got his hands on his face and liquid is seeping between his fingers and like, it's very visceral and you're like, wow, he's sad. But um, yeah, this, fa this was a fascinating section about how, like, we need to know not just that Oliver is clearly crying, we need to know why. The reader needs to understand what has made Oliver cry like that, which is what makes it more of a visceral experience for them. And she did, she did give examples for times when the physical aspect of Show, Don't Tell is applicable. Um, like, if you know the why already when you get to that scene, then you don't have to necessarily re-explain the why someone is sad. You can show it with their voices hitching or, you know, the tears streaking between his fingers or whatever. And then when the subject at hand is purely visual, uh, oh, here's the quote. I thought it was in the other thing, but here it is. As Chekhov so famously said, don't tell me the moon is shining, show me the glint of light on broken glass. However, I'd venture to say that if there is a glint of light on broken glass, that broken glass had better be there for a story reason, either literally, because someone is about to step on it, or metaphorically, as in Brenda's announcement is about to cut Newman to ribbons. Uh, anyway, I knew that quote was in here somewhere. I, I tried to pair it with the wrong myth, apparently, but I knew it was there. So yes, that was a fascinating, fascinating section, because once again, um, it's something that I do struggle with as a writer, the show don't tell balancing act. And also it was fascinating because she was like, it's not just about the physical things that everyone has always told you it's about. And I was like, what? What are you talking about? So it was almost a eureka moment for me, which I rarely ever get with these books, and I liked it. Oh look, there's a myth on the very next page. I'll be back soon. 
I'm gonna get to reading and uh, drinking tea to help with this nonsense and things. We have um, come to the next myth, which was, you know, on the next page after bookmark, like I thought it was. It's been hours since I videoed. I did not get around to reading because I had other things to do today. Uh, but anyway, yes, I finally got around to reading and here we are. So the myth. Literary novels are character driven so they don't need a plot. Reality. A literary novel has just as much plot as a mass market pot boiler, if not more. I don't really, <coughs> excuse me, don't really have an opinion on this. Uh, I mean, I've heard lots of authors, myself included, talk about character driven versus plot driven stories, but not in terms of like, the smart novels don't need as much drama in them, which is sort of the vibe I'm getting from this section so far, because she's like, <clears throat> commercial fiction they say is plot driven, so lots of stuff has to happen, and it has to build and have consequences. Literary novels don't need something as contrived and surface as an actual plot, since they're character driven, slice of life and all that, right? Uh, anyway, and then she says the myth, which is that that is false. But that's not really something that I've encountered in my life as an author. I do talk to a lot of writers, and maybe they just haven't brought this up before, but I have not encountered anyone being like, well see, my novel's a literary novel, so it doesn't have to have all the conflict and drama and consequences in it. Like, that's ne that has never come up in a conversation. So I really don't know how to feel about this myth, but I'm going to read this section anyway. We finished the book. Um, don't mind the bookmark. I just stuck it in the last, um myth, so I wouldn't have to search for it. Hold on, the lens is stuck again. Don't know if that was on screen, but I had to fix it. <sighs> anyway, finished it. We're going to do uh, the last myth and the last chapter, which I found super fascinating, and uh, then some final thoughts, I guess. Let's do this. <clears throat> the final myth. Writers are rebels who are born to break the rules. Reality. Successful writers follow the damn rules. This was really interesting because, um, she, uh, like, really honed in on the, like, you can't, you can't, um, creatively successfully bend story rules to your will unless you know what the story rules are, you know? You can't make it your own unless you start with I don't know, a baseline, you know, and then you can, anyway, it was, it was interesting. I also loved when she was, um, doing her argument, she, like, name dropped somebody and was like, this is the point in the conversation when everyone brings up name, and I was like, I don't even know who that is, but anyway, that's another story. The last chapter, which is where that myth is located, um, is about writers and their brains, which I found fascinating, because, um, up until that point, it had all been about a reader's brain, and how your brain, like, legitimately reacts to stories. Um, and it was all interesting stuff, but, like, part of me already knew it because I read Story Genius, which has the same stuff, and part of me already knew it because I, um, read avidly and kind of, like, intuitively know what readers want. Um, and then part of me is also someone who was crazy about psychology in college and took literally every course that my college offered. Um, so understanding how brains work kind of went there already. Um, so yeah, I kind of like knew all this stuff already for a myriad of reasons. But uh, it was interesting. It was interesting stuff and it was good. And I do, there were a couple chapters, as you would probably see in my like discussion of things. Um, that I found interesting or that I was kind of like learning and gleaning some more information, so that was good. But the last chapter was not on the reader's brain, it was on the writer's brain. And it was fascinating! So, yeah, the, this, here we go, the writer's brain advantage. This was the part that I was like, huh. Anyway, um, it, the section here basically boils down to um, the human ability to infer what someone else is thinking. Because you can't actually, like, read minds, you know. And um, the biggest difference is that writers can do it more than other people. Naturally. Which I thought was really, really interesting. But then she also talked about um, uh, the way we, uh, <laughs> we know our stories so well, so we can't tell if we haven't actually, like, put it all on the page. Because we, you know 
see and connect all the dots. But then if someone else is reading it and doesn't have all the context that we have inside our head, they're like, huh? So anyway, uh, there was a lot of stuff about getting feedback and who to ask for feedback and like how to successfully be a pro, which was all good stuff. Um, so that was great. But like the writer's brain stuff was just fascinating. And what I did love about this book um, is that not only does she quote a lot of neuroscientists throughout, um, when I was reading the acknowledgments, apparently one of them actually read over her book to make sure it was like legit, so that's cool. And um, when I get through the end of the fantasy series, first drafts, I'm going to use the checkpoints, I think, in the end of all these chapters. I feel like you could easily use them before slash during writing process, but I have so much going on with my story right now that I'm not adding another thing. We'll just like put it on the back burner. Oh, so success! One of the only ones that I was learning stuff. And I liked it so much better than Story Genius. Two things with Story Genius. One, in the like, here's how brain science applies and also here's why you should be plotting because only plotting, that's the only way to write a novel. If you don't plot, you're not writing a novel. You're an idiot. Um, yeah, in that section she was so condescending and patronizing and it was just rude. And it wasn't necessarily that I was getting defensive because I don't plot, because I do in fact, plot. So I was kind of on her side of the argument, but I was also like, why are you so rude? So anyway, yeah. Um, so that first section of Story Genius just really was off-putting to me because it felt so rude. Um, and then the rest of Story Genius was her plotting method, which was all well and good, but when I attempted to use it, it was not making me happy. I was not plotting well because I was just like, huh? what's going on? Um, it's probably vlogged to be honest. It's probably on that vlog or possibly on one of my other vlogs. I tried to do this with the fantasy story. The one I'm currently writing or the first one? I don't remember. I think it's the one I'm currently writing. I've been writing this book forever. Anyway, it wasn't working out. It wasn't the way that my brain approaches story and it was painful. I still intend on trying to use the story genius plotting method for a novel from start to finish, uh, but not the ones that I'm super passionate about because I don't want to turn my happy, joyful, creative outlet into pain and agony, which is what it was. <laughs> so I wasn't a fan of story genius because her opening stuff was rude and then the rest of her plotting method was just not my style. Uh, but this, this was great. This was wonderful. I learned from it. It was fascinating. She dove deeper into the brain stuff that she like hinted at in Story Genius. And it was interesting stuff. It was good. I liked it. I'm, I've been won over. I was really, really, um, I may cut a lot of this out because now it seems awkward and embarrassing. Uh, but I was really very, I don't want to say wary. That's not the right word. I was I was defensive going into this book, is what I was. I was like, this book is going to be like Story Genius, so I'm not going to like a period, and also this book is um, not going to teach me anything because none of them do because I know everything because I'm a genius. Um, that's not really the thoughts that were going through my head, but that's kind of like the thoughts that were going through my head, right? Uh, I had my own, I had my own, you know, protagonist journey through this story. It was great. I faced my demons. We've come out the other side. And I am a better person all around. I don't know. Yes. But anyway, point being, um, in the first couple of chapters, actually in chapter one, I turned on the camera several times to be like, <laughs> see how dumb this is? Um, yeah, but the further I got in, I was like, you know what? This is actually an interesting read. <laughs> and then I got to the end and I was like, wow, that was, that was a good book. <laughs> my bad. Huzzah. Literary novels don't really need something as contrived and surface as surface. Huh. As contrived. Mm. Literary novels don't need something as contrived and surface as an actual plot since they're character driven. I can't read. <clears throat> You're not allowed to turn on while I'm filming. <sighs> oh, the lens are open again? Come on. I don't know if you could tell, but I could see the lens.